Yes, yes, yes. How's everybody feeling? Excellent, excellent. Can you hear me well? Okay, good, good, good. Glad to be with you all. This is an exciting topic for many reasons. I'll unpack those, but we'll get right into it and discuss sort of how I've been processing C.S. Lewis throughout my lifetime and even up to this point. So I think that'll be fun. Now we at the River Jordan. John the Baptist baptized Jesus, then he brought him out the water. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all present like how the creation started. Heavens opened up, Spirit descended like a dove, then he came down and rested on him. This my Son in whom I'm well pleased, the Father speaks from heaven, put his blessing on him. This the Logos who met the standard of the law, with no flaws, he kept the standard, no commandment broke at all. Yet he was tempted on every hand and never choked at all. The text reveals he did fulfill all righteousness in fact. Then hit God got this heal and blood got spilled in that sacrificial act. Now he is the promise the Father has made us through prophets and priests to be our mediator. Our baptism basically inaugurated, his baptism basically inaugurated to bring new beginnings, redeeming creation. Now how we access what he earned back then historic objective for women and men with no exceptions he died for our sin Christ said by faith you get baptized in make some noise in this room y'all yes now I don't know I don't know if C.S. Lewis would have liked Christian rap I don't know if he would have but I would like to imagine that he would have at least understood the approach and respected it for sure and when I think about C.S. Lewis and his sort of trajectory in using creativity as a way to engage people on the human experience, I'm just reminded of how compassion elicits creativity. That's what I think I'm seeing when I observe C.S. Lewis's life. And I think about our Lord, right? Matthew 9, 35 through 36. And when Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom himself, right? And healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And you see, as Jesus looks at us in our brokenness, he's moved with compassion and then he begins to engage us as he incarnates. Beautiful reality. And this doesn't always show up in terms of the arts. You may not be a literary writer. You may not be a rapper. Maybe there are a few rappers in the room. I'm not sure. <laughs> but it can show up in many ways. I think about parenting, my grandmother. So when I was a kid, I was always sneaking around listening to rap music. Not the good rap, but the most debased, the most vile. And she would catch me sneaking, listening to rap music. And she would, sometimes she'll let me get away with it. Other times she'll take the cassette tape and toss it in the trash. But I remember over time, she got to a point where she just said, grandson, level with me. She's like, why do you keep listening to this rap stuff? It's just trash. But then she says, but I see that you really like it. She says, why don't you study your schoolwork? And as you're engaging the material, Write songs about the things you're learning. So when you go to school, you'll have the answers in your lyrics, and then, bow, there you go. You can pass the test because you've engaged the content and you've committed it to memory. And when she said that, phew, I said, genius, flame was born in that moment. <laughs> Seriously. So shout out to Francis Jones. And I like to call it edutainment. That's sort of the way I think about what I do. So kudos to Francis Jones for giving me my career path, my vocation, if you will. But that's just one expression of even my grandmother, like our Lord, is, you know, just observing her grandchildren and in this compassionate way. How can I stir him up to using this in a productive way? And I think that was one of the most helpful things. And it's funny because I have a few touch points with C.S. Lewis and this sort of kindred spirit that I believe we share. When I was in seventh grade... And I don't know if this is late or early for reading Lewis, but I found him in seventh grade. We had to read through The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. And me and my friend, we were really drawn to the fawn, Mr. Tumnus. 
In fact, we just like the word fun because it sounds fun. It sounds like the word fun with a British accent. So we would just say, that's fun. That's fun. <laughs> the word was just fun. And we would make fun of each other and say, you're ugly like Mr. Tumnus. So he just became a part of our real everyday life. But I love it. I love it because what you see, even in, in Lewis's approach, there's this suppositional approach to his writing where he wanted the, the works to sort of stand on their own as just good, engaging material if you just read it at face value. And that's what, you know, Fonz and Mr. Tumnus did for us. Just a kid, a childlike experience with good writing. But then there are these, there are these other layers to the story that connects with our faith something that Lewis was very perceptive to engage and to observe in a world. And then I had to write a book report on the lion, the witch, in a wardrobe. And I thought, I said, man, I'm going to show my teacher I've learned this greater lesson from C.S. Lewis. So rather than doing a book report on the lion, the witch, in a wardrobe, I said, I'm going to write my own book, do a book report on it, turn it in so it can be graded, <laughs> and my teacher's going to be impressed. And it did not go over well at all. <laughs> the story was trash. The characters, the character development was trash. And my grade was trash. <laughs> so much like Jonah, I had to go back to the original intention of things and do the book report on the lion, <laughs> the witch of the wardrobe. But it's cool for me because even as I got older, I kept hearing about C.S. Lewis and all these different spaces whether it was, you know, Christian or non-Christian circles, even across different denominations. And as I got older, I was more curious as to how he had this lingering impact across the spectrum. And as I began to process that, I said, man, even in my seminary training, I want to take a C.S. Lewis class. I want to prioritize sort of getting in his mind and understanding that itch because it's very relatable. In fact, the origins of... Christian rap are very similar. So I grew up in the inner city, in the hood in St. Louis, Missouri. And I remember as a kid, uh, there were these guys from the Nation of Islam, and they were very present. They always had their suits on, their bow ties, the fez, you know, that little hat that they wear on their heads. And they would have the magazine, the final call, just a publication giving commentary on, you know, societal ills from an Islamic perspective. And... Um, they were just sort of infiltrating the community. And I remember my grandmother observing that as well and sitting her grandchildren down and teaching us about the nature of God and the nature of the Trinity. And she would use humor and story and even her own experience to lock these biblical truths in our minds. And it worked. So even as I continued to age, I started to rap with guys who were a bit older than me. And they, too, were from the Islamic community the nation of Islam, and when I would go to the mosque and I would sit in there and I would hear these messages, and as I'm listening to this different worldview being articulated, I couldn't help but to access the things my grandmother had taught me using her own humor and creativity as I'm comparing and contrasting the nature of our triune God with this other articulation of a God. And that was a very powerful thing for me. So as I continue to move on and wanted to get in C.S. Lewis's head. I said, I see the connection between Christian rap and this passion that Lewis had. So Christian rap, in a similar way, also recognized infiltrating the urban community of these guys from the Nation of Islam. So what they wanted to do was create a space for young black and brown kids in the hood to know what they believe and why they believe it, to be able to defend the faith, but use an allegory, punchline, simile, metaphors, not necessarily changing the way you dress to be more like a church kid, but keeping something uniquely hip-hop about yourself in a way that doesn't offend God, but also understanding who we are as believers and the gift that God has delivered to us in Christ Jesus. And they sort of drafted this youth culture that caught my attention, and I said, man, this feels natural. So one of the things I want to do here is just read to you the short portion of an article that helps us get behind the mind of Lewis and what he observed and help maybe see how this could motivate us and stir us up to letting our compassion elicit creativity. 
So this article is titled, Why C.S. Lewis Wouldn't Write for Christianity Today. He was asked to write for him, and he said no. <laughs> so let's get into this article. We'll engage it. It's going to be fun. Why C.S. Lewis wouldn't write for Christianity today. I wish your project heartily well, wrote C.S. Lewis to Christianity today, but can't write you articles. Carl F.H. Henry founding editor of the magazine, had in 1955 invited Lewis to contribute to the magazine's first issue. Lewis declined. Henry was not, as the saying goes, one day late and a dollar short. He was over a decade, and no dollar amount would have mattered as Lewis gave the lion's share of his royalties to charity. There was a time when Lewis would have said yes, namely when Nazi soldiers marched into Poland and threatened the stability of the world. Adolf Hitler's influence on Lewis's apologetics is an irrefutable fact. The Fuhrer's evil campaign paved the way for the clear speaking Lewis to engage listeners of the British broadcast service. Even as bombs fell on London, Lewis's baritone voice boomed on radios across Europe. His evangelistic approach was tailor-made for men at war. And I think I, I, there's a story of that you hear these stories about Lewis being in the comfort of Oxford, but then he leaves the comfort of his dwelling, takes the train to London so that he can expose people to the Christian message. And I said, there it is again. I'm seeing this thing that's in keeping with our Lord, this compassion that elicits that creativity. Philippians 2, verse 5 through 8. Have this mind among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So I see this connection between our Lord and C.S. Lewis's observation and approach to leave his own comfort to bring good news. He believed that war postured people to hear straightforward truths about God and faith. Thus, mere Christianity was born in the fullness of time. Published in 1952, the classic was taken from the transcripts of his broadcast from the early 1940s. By the time the book was available in print, Lewis was already changing his approach. Again, he's noticing this this shift in the mood and the spirit of culture. And in that perception he sees and notices, there's this, this sort of post-war apathy that sort of set in on a people that he, in his estimation, saw sort of blocked the intellect and made it difficult to hear straightforward truths. So he said, man, I have to get behind the intellect and sort of come through the back route and engage the imagination. He felt free to do that. As Solomon said, there is a time for war and a time for peace. Lewis modified his methods for both. But supposing that by casting all these things into an imaginary world, Lewis later said of the power of fiction to present truth, quote, could one not thus steal past those watchful dragons? End quote. Lewis thought so. Thus, his writing career focused on smuggling theology behind enemy lines. The enemies Lewis now faced were comfort and post-war apathy. To battle both, he would engage his readers' imagination it would be easy for a young apologist to miss the brilliance of Lewis's creativity. Our day is marked 
by both war and peace, calling for a multifaceted and flexible line of attack. Herein, Lewis's life and witness provide many examples for evangelists today. While Lewis's articulation of the gospel took different paths, they all led to Christ. In so doing, he was able to take aim at both the head and the heart. A C.S. Lewis for the 21st century must offer his apologetics in both war and peace. As Lewis told one group of youth workers shortly before the end of World War II, quote, that is why we apologists take our lives in our own hands and can be saved only by falling back continually from the web of our own arguments from Christian apologetics into Christ himself, end quote. If Lewis was falling back from his arguments, it could only mean one thing. Aslan was on the move. Before introducing the world to the Chronicles of Narnia, Lewis published Miracles in 1947. It was his last straightforward defense of the gospel. Lewis told his friend and biographer, George Sayer, that he would never again write another book of that sort, and he didn't. From that point forward, he published primarily fictional, devotional, and biographical material. His passion for explaining and defending the Christian faith could now best be found in the magical world of talking animals. That's why he declined Henry's request to write articles about Christian doctrine. As Lewis told Henry, quote, my thought and talent such as they are now flow in different, though I trust not less Christian channels. And I do not think I am at all likely to write more directly theological pieces. The last work of that sort, which I attempted, had to be abandoned. If I am now good for anything, it is for catching the reader unawares through fiction and symbol. I have, I have done what I could in the way of frontal attacks, but I now feel quite sure those days are over, end quote. And when I think about the sort of freedom that Lewis had to have felt in the gospel, being flexible with his approach for the sake of reaching people with the good news. And it makes me think about this. I remember in the hood again, and typically our pastor would encourage us to invite people to church, and we would do that. Sometimes people would show up. Sometimes they wouldn't. But there was a murder that happened in a community with one of the popular guys that everybody knew. So my pastor was sort of thinking, man, we got to take a different approach this time. So what he did was he devised this plan to go out on a Friday night with all the goons and the goblins. So what we did was we got soda. You got to say soda, y'all say pop. What you, soda? Okay, cool. We say soda too in St. Louis. Okay, cool. But anybody say pop, we'll say soda pop for the sake of the community, all right? So we would have soda pop and hot dogs, and we just went out on a Friday night just kind of meandering throughout the community, letting people know we're here, we're from the church up the street, we heard about what happened, what took place, we just want to let you know we care. If there's anything we can do, any way we can pray, we'll do that. But there was this one guy, he just kept circling the block, just kept circling around us in an old school box Chevy. So we kind of looking at him, he's looking at us, we looking at him, he's looking at us, and we just, you know, kind of keeping our eye on him. But eventually he pulls over, and my pastor approaches him, and he's like, man, what do you do besides what I think you do? Street pharmaceutics, if you're picking up what I'm putting down. He's like, well, I rap. And my pastor's like, okay, cool. We got some rappers from the church. He was like, rappers from the church? That's an oxymoron. Like, how can you have... <laughs> Rappers from the church. And he was like, no, I, I definitely get it. So he, they went and got another group of guys. Those group of guys came and got me, and then I went over to meet this guy. No exaggeration. This dude is like six foot eight, 
but he's not like a skinny six foot eight. He's like brolic. So he's just standing there kind of towering over me. And he's like, man, let me hear you rap something. <laughs> I'm like, well, first you can't talk to me like that because I'm a grown teenager. <laughs> but you are six eight, so let me oblige. <laughs> and literally, I just started rapping Romans 7. I was just like, dead in the flesh dwelleth no good thing at all. I'm confronted by this fact and often feeling like Paul, that when I want to do good, evil is lurking around. Then it's the law of this mind that I guess is keeping me bound. Now I delight in the law of God, which is after the inward man. Make me lift my hands, say, what a wretched man that I am. Who can deliver me from this body destined of death? If it wasn't for mercy and grace, I don't deserve to be blessed. I'm always focused on the outward things, making me formal, but it's the law of the spiritual, so I guess that I'm carnal. And I just kept rapping this Romans 7. He's like, dang, oh my God, you do what I do except you don't curse. <laughs> that was his interpretation of what I was doing. And I was like, I guess so. So after that experience, I, I just watched the walls come down from this guy who was literally running the entire west side of my city. Like, you couldn't even go to this part of town unless you knew this dude or knew somebody that could vouch for you. And at the time, he was wanted for a murder that he says he didn't do. And we developed a friendship. We exchanged numbers. I was able to buy his first Bible to see him get his first legal job. And uh, it was just was through the arts and creativity that sort of brought us together. And it was a powerful thing. And the Lord was pleased to, over time, to save him. And I remember one time I took him to get something to eat, and I saw one of my girl cousins, and she was like, Flame, come here. I'm like, what's up, cuz? So I go over to my cousin. She's like, what are you doing hanging with this guy? That's the devil himself. I say, no, that's, that's bro. She said, no, you don't know who this guy is. He's wreaking havoc. He's raising the crime rate in our city. And I'm like, Think God is doing something in his heart. She's, I don't care about that. Abandon ship. <laughs> but the beautiful thing is the Lord is, he saved him. He's continuing to save him. In fact, I just got off the phone with him before this talk. So the good thing is that we see through compassion, we see that it elicits creativity in all these cool ways in which God allows these things to play together. The abandoned work he referenced to Henry is likely letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer, published posthumously or posthumously in 1964. It didn't come together until it was set in the context of an imaginary conversation with a fictional friend. It also appears that Lewis opted for a less straightforward apologetic approach following a debate with female philosopher G.E.M. Anscombe at the Socratic Club on the topic of miracles, a debate after which some felt Anscombe was the clear winner. And there are other examples in his public address and personal correspondence where Lewis explained with transparency how defending the gospel had taken its toll. Ultimately, the fall of the Third Reich brought with it an end to Lewis's direct apologetic. And though Britain was at peace, Lewis continued to fight another battle until his death in 1963. Like the deep magic of Narnia, this battle was not with flesh and blood, but with powers and principalities. From wartime talks to talking fawns, his excellent life was committed to the advancement of the gospel. Though dead, yet he still speaks. And when I think about that, I say, man. Lewis didn't get this approach out of thin air. I believe Lewis was observing our Lord who moved into our world. He's, Lewis is reflecting on his own conversion, and he's thinking about Hamlet. He's thinking about Shakespeare. And Lewis wonders, how would Hamlet ever understand anything about his playwright? How would these literary characters ever learn anything about Shakespeare? And Lewis suspected that the only way Hamlet would ever get to know anything about Shakespeare wouldn't be from climbing to the top of the attic looking for Shakespeare. That wouldn't work. So Lewis observed that Shakespeare must act first. 
in a way that Shakespeare would have to write himself into the story. And I say, my goodness, is that not what our Lord has done? Our triune God, through the person and work of Jesus Christ, he writes himself into our story. He steps into human flesh. He steps into time. He steps into space. He lives the perfect life that none of us can live. Then he dies on a cross for our sin. And in that moment of perfect absolution where Jesus says, it is finished. And for those who by faith would lay hold of what Jesus won on the cross can now have the benefits of what Jesus won. And God doesn't stop there, which is something that I was able to learn over the recent years, was Christianity is not this thing that happened long ago, but God continues to engage our world in these creative and cool ways out of the compassion of the perfect God in such a way that he engages mere bread or mere wine, if you want to call it mere, and he unites himself to these regular things. And in the Lord's, at the Lord's table, we receive forgiveness. We receive this immortality regularly applied. And not only that, he binds us together as brothers and sisters afresh regularly. Then through confession and absolution, our Lord still engages us in this creative way out of his own compassion and mercy through the mouth of the pastor where he proclaims you are forgiven in the power and the stead of Christ, I forgive you of your sin. And not only that, we know that baptism is where God watermarks us. He says, this is my son, this is my daughter, and he delivers to us the promises of God and the assurance of our salvation. So we're not looking within to measure our own goodness, our own obedience, seeing our own hypocrisy, and then the, being so discouraged that we conclude Maybe I'm not in. God says, no, look outside of yourself to what I've accomplished and delivered in the waters of baptism. Because baptism is God's promise coupled with the water. Where he promises to give us all the benefits we get from crucifixion, like forgiveness of our sins. Hold up. If you will, it's like irrigation, delivering grace and salvation, a sacrament that he instituted. He can freely do it. He is God, ain't he? It's a work that he does for us, me boy. And our faith just receives it. Trust me, boy. But that faith is a gift he gave us, me boy. I'm not making this up. Look it up, me boy. Unless one is born of the water and spirit, then how could he enter the kingdom of God? So he baptized us in the triune name, Holy Spirit, the Son, the Father, Selah. When I'm doubting my faith and I'm stuck in my head, then I look outside to the promise he gives that baptism saves, was buried and rose up with Christ. That's what our baptism is. And everything Jesus' baptism did, we benefit because our baptism's in his. The spirit, forgiveness, Jesus' perfection, resurrection, the word and the water gives. Amen.